Welcome to episode 574 of the Barcelona Podcast, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Nate Hilton, and joining me today, all the way from another part of the Barca internet, but actually also on East Coast time, it's Hafed, better known as Barca Boy. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be on one of the biggest, if not the biggest English-speaking uh, Barcelona podcast. I did try to be humble back in the day, but uh, Frances <laughs> would say that before we were, and then we actually did have the numbers for it. And I was like, okay, I, you got to you gotta lean into the branding a little bit, as you know. Uh, as you're there are too many player. out there as well, but, you know, I think the numbers speak for themselves for sure. No, there's not too many out there. And again, I've been doing it long enough where I've kind of seen many iterations <laughs> and uh, many competitors. And I say <laughs> it, it should be one big community, one big family. So uh, mm -hmm. as long as I'm not being... Uh, what, I've been asked to come on Real Madrid shows without, and I tried to put my best foot forward, and I've done those shows, and mm -hmm. I've walked into some, uh, some TV traps. I know what you're talking we, about we, that, yeah. And speaking of, speaking of opponents, by the way, actually, as a quick programming note to start the show, the official PSG re preview at the moment, I am hoping will take place in the next few days with a PSG expert, so somebody who covers that team. So today with Hafed, we're doing a bit of Barcelona-centric topics, not really deep diving on PSG just yet, including some listener questions. So, ready to dive in? Absolutely. Let's get right into it. Well, before I get, I let uh, Hafed really go off here, I'm going to have to start with an apology myself. because, And it's one that I know won't satisfy a lot of people because I don't fully apologize. But the English broadcast for the Las Palmas match, they gave the reasoning for the offside call on the Rafinha goal in the first half being about the phase of play. And the explanation that was given on the English-speaking broadcast we were watching on ESPN made sense to me that because Lewandowski had not touched it and it was not fully in possession of Coco, that Rafinha then touching it made it the same phase of play. Therefore, it was offside because clearly he was offside to start the, the play. And just because Lewandowski got in front of him, if Lewandowski had then passed it back to him, then breaking that, that line... Uh, the offside track, I mean, the outside line, then it would have been onside. So that, again, that explanation made sense to me. But I guess I was wrong. And when I'm wrong, I have to admit that I'm wrong because I came out with the five headlines before I looked up the rule and I did not check the official rule. And that's what gets me. So I was wrong and I say I'm wrong. And the reason I know I was wrong is because Mateo Lahoth came afterwards out and said that it was wrong. And so if Mateo Lahoth is correcting a Barcelona issue, then of course, you know that it was wrong. But I think also in the least surprising stance that uh, regular listeners would expect me to take at this point, I will again scream incompetence over collusion. Of course, that's kind of the way I go with things because, and I will back this up a little bit here, that the league of referees this season have been terrible. I've been saying that all season long, uh, whether it's gone for Barca, against Barcelona, whatever, it's, they've been terrible. But instead of some big Barca conspiracy, I want to give a little bit more to it and actually look at the business side of things because money does make everything work more than, you know, we'll say political conspiracies and things like that. So I have read that some of the Liga refs are making about 130,000 euros per year, which is a, a nice, a nice uh, chunk of change in Spain with 3,600 match bonus uh, euros match bonus per match, which means that the refs that you are seeing frequently could be making anywhere from 200,000 to 400,000 on the high end per season, which is pretty well paid, believe it or not, for referees around the world, which for all the travel they do, and they do do more travel than the players. And I'm in the US. So the referees here in the United States have no, uh, they do not feel bad for the referees in Spain and their travel, but it is worse than the players and they are compensated for their travel as well. But this was on the heels and being paid that this all, this season is on the heels of being asked to take a 40% pay cut by the league last season. Because to my understanding, the refs are approved through the Federation, REF, or RFEF, and then contracted by Liga and the clubs for matches. So that does kind of break that whole idea that, you know, La Liga is paying off the refs or there's conspiracy with Real Madrid for the refs. And you could say the refs have a bias towards Real Madrid because of certain affiliations they've had in their past. And, you know, those things are memes in themselves. But I think the idea of the refs and their incompetence, I think it, I, I don't know, the newest conspiracy I'm going to throw at you is something that has to do a little bit more about the business side and the stuff that just has to do with livelihood from week to week than it does about some big conspiracy. But that said, 
I've watched your stuff and you are a bit braver than me. You, you, re- you run out on the ledges a little farther than I do. So if you've got hotter takes on this subject and any controversies, I will give you the floor now. I mean, I fully agree with everything you said. I was also watching the game on ESPN and they were explaining it as well. When I was watching the replay of the goal, I'm thinking that Coco at least controls the ball somewhat to the point that Lewandowski does not touch it, which means that Rafinha is on side. When the, ref- when the commentator explained it to me, made sense with it. I was at peace, just wanted to get on with the game and get the three points. Then I saw the uh, VAR Twitter account, the archival Twitter account that you know always corrects uh, VAR errors during the game, saying that this was 100% a legal goal. I'm there thinking, like, if we don't get three points, this is going to be the biggest talking point uh, in Spain. If we did not win this game, I think the media, especially in uh, Catalonia, would have blown this out of proportion beyond belief. But since we got the three points, despite it only being 1-0, it's not really being talked about. Yet again, like Chavi said after the game, it is a catastrophic uh, refereeing error that a 100% legal goal was not given with the technology that there is. And it's the story of our season. We've seen this already a couple of times this season, and not even just for Barcelona, but other teams in La Liga as well. And, you know, people scream Negreta from the top of the mountains, uh, left, right, and center. But at the end of the day, I've never seen a huge referee decision go for Barcelona in a, maybe like one in the past 10 years, I would say. Like, it is astonishing to see that the league does not make mistakes against when they when they referee Real Madrid games, maybe once or twice. You just to balance things out. But against any other side, more specifically the Barcelonas, the Atleticos, they tend to make errors left, right, and center. But... Most important thing for me was getting the three points. So thank God we got that. But if we didn't, the situation would have been blown out of proportion, in my opinion, beyond beyond belief. I mean, Barca, to remind everybody, over the last year and a half, they're, what, are they third in world football in total chances created or something? So mm-hmm. and the numbers game does tell you that you would expect that the teams that are the highest in the chances they create are likely going to have the most opportunity for mistakes to be made or for the right calls to be made. And that's almost a credit to the way that Barcelona play. They, even if they don't score all those goals, they still create so many chances that it creates these conversations. Now, that was kind of a negative story to start. So let's uh, <laughs> shift a little bit to something positive because in La Masia news, which people know I do my big, you know, every few months I come out with something. And instead of doing a winter one this year, I did a uh, the YouTube shorts. So this is the time when I'm going to plug those YouTube shorts if you haven't seen those. But in La Masia news, I do hope, as I said, people are enjoying those La Masia profile shorts over on YouTube. But Guy Fernandez, known on the team sheet as Guillermo, uh, which I think is going to be a bit easier for me as I continue to do my Catalan on Duolingo. So before I get there, Guillermo now, he made his Barca Athletic debut over the weekend. At 15 years, 9 months, and 13 days, he beat Lamina Mall's record by 10 days. So now the official youngest ever Barca Athletic debuts are Guy Fernandez, Lamina Mall, and then Alejandro Grimaldo. Uh, Grimaldo. Those are the three. And fortunately, I think due to everybody getting acquainted with Lamina Mall, Kubarsi, Hector Fort, and Mark Yu, I get to take that risk now and say with kind of full voice uh, that I, I'm going to jump on that, that hype train for Guillermo now. I've been on it since the summertime, since the first time I got to see him, and since uh, smarter people than me looking at the academy kind of tipped me off to him. So with those four around the first team, I can say now that I think he is the player in the Masia with the highest potential who is yet to debut for the first team. I think he is the one with the highest ceiling. So you'll have to wait, as I said, for the end of the season for my longer report on him. But the basically the spark notes of it at the moment are that he is strong for his age. He's an attacking midfielder. That is his position. So he's not going to solve any defensive midfield problems. He's not going <laughs> to solve any winger problems on the left side, but he is another attacking midfielder who has a bit of a goal-scoring touch. Again, he's already kind of got that adult body, very much like Mark Yu has. Um, And what I do and am most impressed by him is that I think that many of the things that I'll talk about, again, in that longer review, is that a lot of his skills will translate to the higher level. And there are players where I'll, when I cover the academy, I say that there are just there are things that I'm not sure are going to translate well, especially with wingers. That that obviously is a case where it's like, okay, you can beat this guy off the dribble and you can't. Or if you have a number nine or a center back who was bigger for his age, and so once everyone else physically catches up, does he have the skills to kind of mature into the top level? For I, I almost have no worries about that for this 15 year old in, in Guillermo. The body is already kind of there, but his skills don't necessarily need his. We'll say you know, bigger frame at this point. I think all the skills are there, close control, everything. So to kind of add to this, uh, the idea of, you know, bringing up this, this uh, potentially another crack before the end of the season, by the way, because Lamini Mall made his debut 
last spring, as I remind you. So there's nothing mm-hmm. stopping Guillermo from debuting in what ne- at the end of next month before the league is over. But an old friend of the pod, Naveed, brought up, Xavi may be gone this summer regardless, and we'll get to that in, in a bit, but his legacy may seem much kinder to him in the future due to the memories and the young players he's put in the team. Because, you know, I, growing up, you know, I mean, having seen Messi debut, uh, but not actually seen, seen the match, but having been around when Messi debuted and everything like that, you know, there's, regardless of what f- uh, Frank Ricard did in his final season and regardless of how, of, a, of a, just a toxic situation that was right before he was going to leave, everybody does kind of remember, I mean, the year before that, which was when Messi debuted. And you kind of will always, yes, the first Champions League, but you're always going to connect Ricard to Ronaldinho and Messi's uh, in initial seasons. And that's how you can remember it. And I think when it comes to really, really great, you know, generational players, which is, as I've said, Barcelona don't even have one generational player. They potentially have a whole generation of players, which kind of makes it easier for all of them. Um, because Xavi, according to the CIES football, is third on the list, that being Barcelona, in the five major leagues in Europe with the highest percentage of minutes played by under 21 players. Um, only behind Strasbourg and Lyon. So number three in the top five leagues. Barca is the only team in the quarterfinals of the top 10 on that list. And fortunately for Xavi, as I just said, very much every time I talk about Ansu Fati and Ernesto Valverde, how if Ansu Fati had become the world beater that we expected him to, I would always think about the way Ernesto Valverde kind of trusted in the 16-year-old kid and guided him to, you know, having a good season. And the, the manager you debut under always gets remembered better in hindsight. So if there's a day 10 years from now, which at that point, Lamine will only be 26, my goodness. But if a 26, 27-year-old Lamine Mall and a 27-year-old Falgu Barsi are holding up a Champions League trophy, I'm going to remember Xavi in those moments because they he was the guy that brought them all up. And I, I'll i have my first images that I have on my you know YouTube channel and uh, the first conversations I had on the podcast are going to be about how Xavi trusted in these kids and how Xavi also had a system that made them as I've said all month, two of the most important players in an 11 game unbeaten streak when they were just teenagers. Yeah, it's, uh, they might even miss left the Champions League this season. You never know. The route is there. The route is possible. Um, but to quickly talk about first, Aguilia Fernandez, I've been talking about him since I think the very early of last season after we, you know, we um, activated all the palancas and levers and stuff like that. And the club rated him so, so highly, especially when he was at the cadet team and in the juvenile side as well. He was the player that the club really wanted to renew in the in the younger ranks. He was asking for a bit of money. People were thinking, okay, we're going to have another Elijah Mariba 2.0 player. That's, gonna, that's good. Has talent, but is focusing on money. In the end, that wasn't the case. He did, he did renew his day. Exciting, exciting talent. I've been seeing a lot of his clips over the past year. And he, he brings up the question of, we do need someone in the squad to provide coverage and competition for the likes of Pedri and Gabby. Because Pedri is in and out of the squad with injuries. You have Gabby coming off the back of an ACL, which is a 50-50. Come back the exact same player. Hopefully, come back different. You need someone in there. You know, that's why there's been reports about Alex Garcia. I'm thinking you have Fermin Lopez. You have Pablo Torre coming back from loan from Girona as well. And you have Gidi Fernandez. Why is there the need now to even invest in another midfielder? Of course, in the interior side, the pivot is going to be different so exciting talent very very interesting to see if he goes on the preseason tour or not I think if Chavi is the coach come July he might include him on that plane if not I think it's going to be pretty difficult for him with the big squad that we have with all the low knees returning and knowing Barcelona how slow they work some of these lone players will be on that plane to the American tour well I would throw in that you said about the contract and I had looked at this too I think there might be something in there that he goes on the preseason tour because, I mean, and that's why I think for the same reason that Mika Faye went on the tour. I think they got Mika Faye's signature with the guarantee that he'd go on the preseason tour with them, like as a little promise. So mm-hmm. I would not be too surprised by regardless of who the manager is, if he is on that tour, even if he never makes his debut this spring or doesn't even debut until, who knows, right? February, March mm-hmm. or whatever of next season. I could I could definitely see him on the tour, regardless, just he- about contractual stuff. I think he should be anyways, just to really get embedded with the first team as well into the culture, yeah, style, and getting used to how, uh, you know, first team squad runs and things like that. I think he should definitely be on that plane. But in terms of squad depth, that squad is really, really full. I think last the last uh, American tour, only Alex Vai 
was the player with the least amount of minutes he came on, I think, in the AC Milan game for, like, three minutes, and that was it. So even him going on the plane and not getting any minutes for preseason is still fine because, again, people have this misconception that, oh, Barca Athletic players have to, you know, train there, help to get the promotion and stuff like that, where the reality is the priority is the first team. This is why people don't like it when didn't like it when Garcia Pirenda got sacked. This is Joao Laporta's philosophy, that the first team is the priority no matter what. Yes, Barca Athletic getting promoted is great and all that, and them playing well is all great, but the priority is the first team. So... In regards to Fernandez, top, top talent. And what Chappie has done with the youngsters has been nothing short of impeccable. Even in his first uh, season when he came in November, giving debuts and giving chances to the likes of, you know, Ilyas Akumach and Fran Jugla, who've gone on to do other things, giving them that, you know, age is just a number. If you're good enough, you're going to play. And that's what you want to see. I, I can't remember even when Frank Reichard brought in Messi, you know, he had Fabio Capello trying to, you know, uh, so offer him up in the Juan Gamper to try and get Messi on loan to Juventus, and he said no. But since then, I can't remember any, you know too many players investing, uh, too many coaches, should I say, uh, giving that opportunity to La Masia. And that's why we saw a lot of these La Masia talents leave, you know, the likes of Denny Almo and things like that. All, like Some of them, I didn't even, when I see like good Spanish talent, I, I realized half the time that they're from La Masia, but they never got that opportunity in the first team, especially during Bartomeu's tenure where he just went out and just bought Arda Turan for $40 million or Alex Vidal for $40 million. We really lost that La Masia identity. But since, you know, I would say just before Chavez come in, because the talent was just so raw and so, you know, great, it kind of broke through on their own, but Chavez really, you know, opened the door to them. And it's exciting to see, and it's very also happy for me from a Barcelona fan, thinking that, okay, we know how to go to the market now and spend upwards of $150 million, $250 million, uh, $250 million on six different players to invest the squad. You can, you know, spend a good $100 million on two key players to really strengthen the squad and then trust the academy. Yeah, I always wonder, though, how much credit I'm supposed to be giving Xavi and how much I kind of just, again, covering La Masia for the last 15 years. This generation, I sound like a broken record this season, but I keep telling you, and I'm bringing up another, you know, more and more names, because even with Guy Fernandez, his cousin Tony is not as good, but his cousin Tony plays not a similar position, but he's so much he's versatile and kind of like a false nine in a way that you just usually don't see as like, that's his best position, uh, very much in a Julian Alvarez kind of way for Man City. But you know, so there are so many players in this generation from 2000. Boy, I'm trying to do the math here from 2006 to 2008. Is that right? Yeah, like around yeah. there, around yeah. there. Yeah, maybe even and then into 2009. And so that generation there. And when I look at who Xavi's bringing up to the first team, Xavi didn't have doesn't have to bring up 15, 16 year old kids to the first team like that to the to that point. Like we didn't always see them in training either under the likes of Alverde or now Kuman had to because he literally needed active bodies half the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we didn't necessarily see that with, with Alverde. We didn't see that even with Luis Enrique. Very rarely, Luis Enrique did not really bring up a lot of young players at all in that time. So to have Xavi kind of bring up these players, yes, the first team only has 19 official players, but he doesn't necessarily bring up the Barca Athletic players. He brings up U19 kids to fill mm -hmm. in, but there are always a lot of, most of them are the high potential kids. Like there's the same ones that you and I talk about, like, Oh, the club is high on them or that we've been impressed when we see, we see them. Those are the kids that Xavi's bringing up. So he's not just bringing up kids for bodies. He's investing in the kids that, that he believes in. They're going to probably be the highest level. So again, I never know how much credit to give him for talent identification, or <laughs> I just say, well, no, it makes a lot of sense that he's bringing Like if, Again, I'm over here and I'm like watching on these grainy screens or whatever. And so what do I know? Because I don't see this kid in day in and day out. I don't know. His, you know, you don't know their mentalities. But if I am high on them and Xavi's high on them, then maybe there's something there's something right there. But yeah, so I, I just I never know. I'm not taking away anything from Xavi for bringing them up to training because he still has to do that. But it's exciting to me that this generation is that talented. And this is just another example. Again, the Barca Athletic debut record is not a big deal but still breaking that record tells you the promise and it's so exciting that there's already a 16 year old who's already you know kind of written his path and gave fernandez could next season just follow the same path i mean did um to to a certain degree but okay mm -hmm. let's dive into some questions now so the the pace of the show is going to pick up a little bit those are kind of our big our big topics so starting with the patreon questions because a reminder for as low as three dollars you get the shows without the ads and you're guaranteed to have your question answered patreon questions guaranteed everybody else yeah, I can take some liberty. So even if I don't give the best answers to your patron questions, you can still ask them and I'll, I'll try my best. So first, from patron Daniel, with a pivotal summer coming up and a big coaching shakeup coming in elite football, how much of a red flag is it that Laporta's plan is apparently to hope that Xavi changes his mind about leaving? 
Should Barca fans be concerned about the board's lack of process and due diligence and how much of this is related to Laporta's upcoming re-election campaign? Um, I would fully 100% disagree with that comment about it being a red flag. I don't think it's a red flag at all because from the beginning, from, you know, the beating, losing to the Super Cup to Real Madrid 4-1, getting knocked down to Copa del Rey at MMS, losing 5-3 to Villarreal at home, Laporta never, ever, ever contemplated for one second sacking Xavi. It was Xavi himself who decided to leave. And when you look at the replaces out there, you know, your Hansi Flicks, your Rafa Marquez, your Mikel Arteta, the Zerbi, Tuchel, all have their pros and cons, and no one screams out to you. Luis Enrique does, but getting him out of PSG is almost impossible. Mikel Arteta has some good uh, pros to him as well, but again, getting him out of Arsenal is difficult. So when you have no managers available on the market, you also have the likes of Liverpool and Bayern Munich looking for top managers as well, making the competition more fierce. The you know highly talented managers right now all have release clauses as well, which yes, Barcelona can pay, but would be absolutely idiotic when you need you know investments in the squad as well. I also no red flag. That you said can pay. I don't know if they can pay. That's actually like the other part of that. That yeah, I think I think, like, I think there's a big misconception about this. I think Barcelona have money. I don't think the problem is the actual fee itself. I think the problem is the registration part. So with La Liga and FFP. So I think the money is there. The club can spend ten million, but would that be feasible enough? And would you know bring in their coaching staff and unregistering Chavi, registering them as well? I think that's where the complications come in, based yeah. on what I've seen and what I've been told. But no red flag for me whatsoever. If I'm Laporte as well, I'm doing the same thing. My only concern is that they leave to the last second. As soon as Chavi was sacked, I did a live stream saying that the new manager, whoever it is, Chavi staying or whoever it is, has to be known by at least, I would say, the beginning of June because you're going to have to have your summer transfer target sorted out, of course. You know, decide who's going to leave and who's going to stay because that's when the offers come in for some of your good players, you know, 60 million for Rafinha or Kunde or whoever the case may be, and the new manager has to be there to decide that. But when you look at the replaces out on the market, you look at and see how Chavi's done now since this resurgence for me personally i'm doing the same thing i'm sitting there waiting for chavi to stay because he, they want to have a project they don't want to balance between managers left right and center even during laporta's time his first tenure in the presidency it took him a long time to sack frank reichardt of course he never sacked pat pat left but laporta is someone who wants to give players uh, managers trust he wants to give some you know foundation and only worst case worst case scenario where there's no turning back that's when he gets sacked that's always been laporta's philosophy um and again the the real quorum for me is the available replacements. I think that Xavi is better right now than 90% of the replacements. Only Luis Enrique, I think, is a better coach. Of course, Pep is not going to come. Laporte, uh, Jurgen Klopp's taking a sabbatical. Arteta, for me, I would say is maybe at the same level. Maybe a minor, minor downgrade since he hasn't won anything per se. Anyone else for me is a downgrade. I think Nagelsmann is good, but he has a lot of his pros and cons for what he's done at Bayern Munich and now being in the German national team, only playing, you know, four games Every eight months, I think I, I would I would take Nagelsmann. I wouldn't be disappointed with that. Anyone else for me is just a downgrade. So what the board are doing, you know, trying to hope and pray that based on love and stuff like that and moment and momentum and everyone being happy that Chavi stays, I have no problem with that. But I'll tell you this right now. I do not think Chavi's going to stay. He can win the double. We can have classical Champions League final. He'll win it 8-0. I still don't think Chavi will stay. Because the reality is that when these not only – uh, managers, but even Barcelona legends make these key decisions. You know, when Victor Valdez announced he was leaving, Carlos Puyol, Xavi as a player, Iniesta, Mascherano, Luis Enrique as a coach, Pep Guardiola as a coach, never do they ever turn back on the decision. Because then they just look, not like hypocrites, but they just look like they're playing off our emotions. They want to make sure that the decision is final because they want to be respected. Because I think it would be better for Xavi for his legacy to win a Champions League or La Liga and then leave, especially when he said that he was leaving. Then him saying, oh, I'm going to stay now because, you know, we're on the hype and we're on the vibe and everyone's happy and the, the, the club want me to stay. I, of course, as a fan, I'll be absolutely ecstatic. I'll absolutely take it. But from the grand scheme of things, we look back on this in a few years thinking, oh, was that really right from Xavi? You know, saying he's going to leave and sending us all into manic attack and me making eight live streams about Xavi leaving and being sad about it. You know, all these things like that, I think we will play a part later on. But in terms of the board, I'm 100% uh, backing their decision to wait for Chavi. I think it's the correct move, especially with the manager market being quite dull, I would say, at the moment. Yeah. In the case of of, of Xavi and his decision to leave, I, I did talk to Paul uh, Bluse of The Athletic last week, and we talked a lot about that burnout. And that historically is the way it is. I mean, Guardiola is the best example. And Fortunately, it was just such a famous example that I think Xavi is burned out and even all that winning isn't going to stop the burnout. I think he's burned out. I think he's tired of the internal at the moment and whether 
his new adventures or coaching experiences or whatever. I mean, that's why people say that they think he's going to step aside for a year. That tells you why he's leaving. He's not leaving because he feels like he's failed Barcelona or anything like that. It's that this, the pressure of being the manager of Barca is just so much that he's already burned out because, yeah, this team is not flown high enough and far enough and succeeded enough to kind of stave off that burnout, that he's been under pressure since the first game that he started Ilas Akomash, you know what I mean? And have to start to pick young players. And so I think that burnout is real. And that's why I, I kind of do agree, not even kind of, I, I agree with you that I think Xavi's leaving no matter what. And Facebook group member Tomas had an answer that, well, has my answer, I would say, in his question that he had asked, because he brought up Rafa Marquez in this conversation. And my gut could be wrong here, but as people have been listening to me for seven years now, my gut... I feel like I've got like a 75, 80% track record. So <laughs> on everything right now, my gut says that the plan all along, and it, for those watching, I have my, my quotes, just my fingers are going crazy because I think the plan all along could potentially be Rafa Marquez if Xavi does decide to continue and, and says, I am burned out. I'm leaving the way we expect him to. And I think there is conversations. Like what I do believe is that they are doing at least their due diligence that it would be, <laughs> there's no way because of the politics of it, by the way, as well, because you know what's going to happen. If that, if, if, if it's just Rafa Marquez and then he completely falls on his fla- uh, face and then he needs to be sacked by November, right? Because Barcelona have, have won two games out of the first 10 or whatever. And you got to get Marquez out the door next October. If that happens, you know that Marca um, and, and, uh, Everywhere else, whatever, like uh, El Chicharonga, like whatever. They're all going to come out with those stories about how Laporta never talked to Nagelsmann or never talked to um, Aminion or never talked to Flick or whatever. You know what I mean? Like name a manager. They didn't have those conversations. And those stories, and again, air quotes around stories, are going to all come out October, November, if Mark is the one who falls on his face. But I can almost guarantee, or I would believe, because Laporta, even beyond Xavi, wants to remain president of Barcelona when the next election comes up in two years' time. And so to keep his presidential, uh, to create a new cycle, he's going to need to do some winning in the next year or two, and he's going to need to get this coaching change correct. So I, I would believe that they are doing their due diligence behind the scenes. And listen, if there's not a good number, if there's not a good fit, then again, I think they're going to fall back on the idea that the plan was for Xavi to stay. And Xavi said no, and it's his right to do that. And I think this, the club will support him. And then Rafa Marquez will get his best shot. And we don't know. If he succeeds, then yeah, Laporta looks like a genius. And then he wraps it up. <laughs> but if he falls in his face, I mean, then done of course, I said all the stories well, are going to come out. Not, and you know, the first time, that is right? what happens when you have politics running your club, baby, instead of some billionaire owner that makes decisions. Like that, That's the way it goes. When you have socios voting on things and the, the club is supported by both politics, but also this, this kind of sense of duty. There's a sense of duty to do what you can for your club that doesn't exist other places. So, uh, all right. Now, you better bring up Luis Enrique. So we got one question for PSG for you from Patreon Peter. How should Barcelona's defense set up against PSG's pacey front three? I think it's pretty standard right now. I think in terms of personnel, it's I would go with Jules Koundé, Paco Barsi, Ronald Arujo, and Joao Cancelo. Where their position in the back line, I think, is... I think up for debate, will Cancelo play right back or left back? Will Conde play right back or center back? Will Aruho play right back or center back? I think those questions are going to be lingering in Xavi's mind up until the Wednesday clash. But I think in terms of personnel, it's set in stone in terms of, you know, how the system works, in terms of how they play together, in terms of form as well. Conde's forms uh, over the past month have been nothing short of immaculate. Cancelo's, of course, one of our best uh, fullbacks going forward. Aruho defensively is the best. And Kobarsi on the ball is the best as well. So you have that balance as well. Um, I think the real question is, will he put Aruha right back for uh, the marking of Kylian Mbappe? Which, to be honest, I wouldn't mind. I think what he should do is initially start with Kunde at right back, see how Mbappe plays in the game. Will he drift inside to the middle? Will he stay wide on the left? And then maybe adapt a little bit. I don't remember the game against Alaves at home where um, uh, Samu, the Alaves striker, scored you know, in the first minute. And he was absolutely rinsing Kunde at uh, center back. And Aruha was somehow, some way starting at right back that game, switched them during the game, I think around the 25th minute mark. We looked much better. We looked much composed. Kone even got the assist for the Lundowski equalizer in the second half from right back. So 
we know that Chavi can adapt during games. We t- usually takes a very long time to do it. That's one of the, my only criticism for Chavi is his in game management. A lot of times is I think lacking. So that's what I would personally do. Start with Kundi at right back, and that's what he's been you know more natural this season over the recent games. See how he does. See how Mbappe plays. If needed, you can switch Aduho and Kunde in-, in game to have Kunde play right center back, and then Aduho right back to mark out uh, Mbappe. But again, in terms of the, in terms of personnel, I think it's pretty much set in stone at this point. Yeah, and you brought up that example. I bring up another example in Marcus Rashford last year against Manchester United and that decision to keep Araujo out wide when Rashford was already coming into the middle. I think that cost Barcelona against Manchester United in the Europa League. I think that is the... Honestly, I think back to that as being definitely a top three tactical mistake that Xavi has made. As I, I usually defend him on tactical stuff. I think that's, again, really what his bread and butter is. And that was just, I think, one of the more egregious ones in his in his tenure, uh, thinking back to that. And I agree to your point, too. Cancelo, Kubarsi, Araujo, Koundé. I started in that order as well. This is the most balanced back line at the moment. It's the first choice back line at the moment. It's the most informed back line at the moment. But I think most importantly, to your point as well, I would not shift Araujo onto the right to start against Kylian Mbappe to begin the match. I think Koundé is, at the moment, in fantastic form. He also plays the same position and regularly goes against Kylian Mbappe in the French team. So this is a matchup that I'm going to trust Koundé on until, to your point, it doesn't work anymore. You And then Araujo, if he has to be switched out, you have that in your back pocket and you do that. On the other side, as far as what do you do with Cancelo against MLA? Well, again, I do have some ideas on that, but I will save that for the preview. So that'll be, uh, we'll plug that in the next few days and you can you can see that. Uh, now, this question is about the Barca Femini from Patreon. Number sign six, the great GR8 with an exclamation point. Jonathan Graldez is coming to DC, which is kind of exciting. Um, the Patreon says maybe a spirit Barca exhibition game or an entry point for some older players a la Inter Miami looming. Maybe I, I, okay. I can't speak to that. But the follow up question was, what do you know about Pere Ramal, which is a likely successor? Now, uh, or the search process in general. Now, I, I've heard that it's going to be him, that he is going to be the guy. And I actually think he's a really interesting pick that I'm actually pretty excited about because I think he's also the right man for the job based on the way that this team is going and where they've been. He was a former youth coach in the academy until 2020 with the boys. Then he took a quick year-long stint at Romania. Then he came back to join the women's staff in 2021, of course, being a part of the team that won the Champions League. He is apparently well-liked in the locker room and respected by the players. And this is a really important point here with the Femini. He is respected by the players for his tactical sense and his desire to want to keep playing the Femini in their preferred 4-3-3 that fits this team and this personnel so well. And this is kind of, I mean, and this is what happens when you coach some of the best teams in the world, that they kind of do, in a sense, you coach to who they are instead of trying to imprint your ideas on them and especially in the women's game in the women's game it is really best to squeeze out the best moments of individual uh, individuality in a way that it doesn't necessarily translate as well to the men's game if that makes sense like you can't if you have the worst player of the 22 in a men's game you still might lose the match but in a women's game if you can get the best out of your star and the only exception to this rule of course is the messy rule that I would say Messi for all of 2021 was kind of an example of that <laughs> when he was every week kind of being the guy, being the individual, but Messi notwithstanding. Um, I, I think that tends to be something I've noticed in, in a lot of the women's games that I've watched that again, getting the best out of Caroline Graham Hansen, just giving her the keys to the castle and saying, go at it. We support you have fun, do your thing. We're playing a four, three, three. Our midfields will, will come in and support you when you need it, but we're going to trust you in those situations. And everybody kind of has their job in that system. And this team really is, to that point, about tinkering around the edges to win the Champions League. That is what it is. It's not about making sweeping changes, bringing in somebody with new ideas, uh, bringing in a flashy name at the moment. I will also add that I have been doing some homework for the end of the month and the next wave of young Barca Femini players. Because, again, it's weird because they are a team built to win the Champions League again. But they also have one of the better you know, next generations of young players also coming up. And his work with them prior to this could pay huge dividends as well, with the biggest name being Vicky Lopez, because Vicky Lopez is the feminist version of uh, Lamini Mall and going back to Ansu Fati. I mean, that is who she is. She is unbelievable. An attacking midfielder, a winger, can do everything. So just to give away the 
the big play, the highlight of all that stuff. And I, and I do think Pere, um, Ramayu is the, is the man for the job in this case. So I, I'm actually pretty, not even excited, because it's not an exciting hire, but it's the right hire, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, I, I fully agree. And it's going to be exciting to see how he does next season. I, I think it, what, his expectations for next season will depend on how the Femini side finishes this season, of course, with the Champions League. Uh, they got Chelsea coming up next. So, I mean, it's going to really come down to how they succeed in that. And then I think, like you mentioned as well, the squad right now is at a point where this is what you want to see week in, week uh, season, season season in, season out, which they'd be challenging at the highest level. Just like Barcelona. That's why I think, you know, uh, for the first team going back super, super quickly, that we need someone with experience to come in as the manager. Same thing with the feminine side. They're at a team now where the core is strong. You have a few younger players that can, you know, start that next generation. But right now, the current generation is what's built, you know, saying the building blocks and what's, you know, pushing the team forward. So, yes, very excited appointment. Someone in house as well, which I think is very, very important. And I think how this season ends for the feminine side will determine and factor in what the expectation and how the standards will be judged for him next season. Yeah. And I will say that it's, I know it doesn't do well on a podcast, but it's supposed to be a pretty admirable trait to say, I don't know. And what I don't know is that I have heard rumblings that the Femini, due to the total budget of the FFP of the even the men's team, that there's some connection between all of them uh, and the, the total the total income being brought in, which is why for the the basketball team or the Balancesto, they didn't bring back Miritich. Uh, or Nikola Mirotic, their best player from a season ago, and they tried to find some cheaper options, including Jabari Parker. And for the Femini, I've heard a similar thing, where instead of going out and being able to to get a new shiny toy like they keep doing the last few seasons and going to get a player from Wolfsburg or Chelsea or PSG or Bayern or whoever, and they bring them in, I've heard that they may not be able to do that this season. Now, the team itself, though, is talented enough. And I said, there's a generation coming up that can fill in, especially in, in Liga F, because... The Spanish league is so weak to the point where, or catching up, I don't want to say weak, catching up to them, you know, Real Madrid even were closer in the table against everyone else. But when you watch El Clasico for the Femini, it just wasn't, it still was not close. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so until Real Madrid and Atletico Madrid were even down a little bit this season. So until everybody kind of catches up a bit to Barca Femini in the league, they can go in the league with heavy rotations, with kind of playing everybody in their squad. Uh, that they, they don't need a superstar signing from elsewhere necessarily to survive in the league. But of course, yes, in the Champions League, they got to keep everybody enough healthy where they can go 15, 16 deep of world class players to potentially win the Champions League. So I, I think that's going to, that is that tightrope that most of these top women's, as the funding is continuing to come in, most of these top women's teams are kind of, they're, again, they're walking that tightrope and saying, hey, do we, do we have enough to reinforce or pay for somebody? to come from, you know, the NWSL in America, because those contracts are usually, I know it sounds silly, but those are more guaranteed, even though those players are underpaid. You know, that's Mm -hmm. just how it is in the U.S. even. But those players are underpaid, but those contracts are a little more guaranteed. So you do see a lot of players, you know, going to, and as I've covered the women's game too, especially in Spain, because it's so recently professionalized, a lot of these players are still including, now I'm kind of spoiling my stuff. Here I am spoiling my stuff. But Martinez Fernandez, uh, one of the the young center backs, she is part time working in the biomedicine field. She's in her spare time. <laughs> she's continuing her studies in a biomedical laboratory because that is what it is. That it's like she, I mean, one MCL tear or ACL tear, which is more common in the women's game as well. Mm-hmm. And you're done at 24. And now what are you going to do? So a lot of these, you know, women are still getting their degrees and continuing their schooling and making sure they have a a, a way to kind of move out. And with the NWSL in the U S it tends to be able kind of, it can be at times for certain players, especially in Spain, an easier way to kind of transition into their, their next phase of life. Even if they go back to Spain, uh, they're able to get some stuff. So it, there's a lot, the life parts of it, just like the referee stuff, like it's it just the life parts of it are going to be a huge part of it. And that is also what a manager for the feminine has to contend with. He has to contend with players who are just like, I'm a professional player. I make good money. Well, good enough for, you know, comparison to a lot of the other women's players and I want to win champions leagues, but also he's contending with a 21 year old. Who's like, Hey, I might, <laughs> I might retire 22 because I think that might be my calling in life. And like, how much am I really going to make here? If I, especially if I don't become a starter and become one of the top players in, in our side and, and all those things. So yeah, uh, 
the feminine is always interesting. And I, I, I do apologize to this season. I've not been able to cover them as much as I'd like to, which is life for me. Same thing. <laughs> All the things off the field uh, kind of get in the way. So I, I've been focusing a little more on La Masia and this amazing generation this year. So that's kind of been my spare time, but I still watch feminine as much as I possibly can. Now we are going to go back to first team though. From Patreon Mark, is it time for Barca to adapt to a faster, more athletic style of football? As in, go all in on a Nico Williams type and possibly sacrifice a Pedri or Gabi, who's not going to be sacrificed at all. PSG coming up might be a good test case for this. Um, in terms of sacrificing Pedri or Gabi, that will never happen. I mean, I do have a hot take on, on Pedri that I think that his situation needs to be evaluated, especially with the constant injuries. I mean, I get it. He played that one season, 70 plus games, but that's almost two, three years ago. And this, he's still, he'll come back after a month long injury, do some weird pass and he's, you know, knocks his uh, hamstring, he's out for another month. So I've been really on the fence with Pedri saying that we need to renew his contract soon. I think, you know what, put him on the market, see what bites, see what happens. If you do renew his contract, renew it on a fair wage, you'd be same lower. I wouldn't really increase it. Gabby, for me, is just an undisputed player who stays no matter what. But I do agree that we need to have, you know, a bit more dynamic, a bit more quick wingers. I love our wingers right now. I think even Lemanyama Mal included, not really as rapid and as tenacious as you want in wingers. They're not like, a, you know, Usman Dembele or a Jeremy Doku, which we've seen at Barcelona in the past, which we don't really have right now. They're really tactical wingers, more so create creative wingers as well. Yes, they have speed to them. But we don't really see it. I don't even remember if Rafin has ever sprinted down the, the down the wing in a Barcelona shirt ever. It's always cut inside, make movements in you know inter interiorly as as well. I think Nico Williams is a fantastic player. I also really 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 love Estavio William Messino in Brazil, who you know will be available for the same price as Nico Williams. The issue is that he plays on the right wing, and you already have Lemon Yamal there, so making that kind of investment where he can make it on the other side, which where we need it makes more sense. Also, Nico can play on the right as well. So I and think, you know, Nico's also 22 at the moment and Messino is 16. So yeah. he also can't arrive until he's 18 years old either. And that is a, I I'm, I'm with you. I, I want to, we could do, I wish I did not plan a Messino segment here, but I, I, <laughs> I've written about him before. I, I really do consider him, you know, it's like, he certainly is the, with his connection to liking Barcelona, we'll call it, you know, a dream signing, but there's just, I don't even care about like I've watched him enough and I've seen Lamine Mall this year. I don't care. Like those the, those two kids are talented enough that you if you can acquire that kind of talent and they want to make it work, you make it work if you can physically afford it. Like it's just that's, that's what, exactly what I is. said. I said chuck yeah, one yeah, of them you, on the left. Doesn't matter, man. Just put the put whoever one who can play the left the best on the left. <laughs> to your point, I think for Messino, my concern is his timeline. Barcelona is again with their FFP and everything where they need like on the pivot and a left wing where they need to spend the money and his timeline of it's, it's a tough thing. Like I, I, I tweeted about early in the week when I saw um, Kevin Sullivan, the 14 year old for Philadelphia union already signing like that, the pre-contract to go over to man city when he's 18 and join city group. And then last year they, they sprung for a promising 18 year old Mexican player. And just seeing how man city they're already it's 14 now or, or um, Moscardo with PSG at, who I thought was coming over way before a year or two before he was ready coming over to Europe to PSG. And so you're seeing now this, this, this arms race for 16, 17 year old kids. And I just, I'm concerned for you Messino fans out there that I'm really high on him. And I think there's no reason not to be like, every time you see him, you're like, yeah, of course this kid, I, it's what an 80, 85% chance he's can't miss, right? Like what is his floor? I think his floor is pretty gosh, darn high. His floor is still being the best player at man at West Ham. You know what I mean? Like that's where I see like his yeah. the, a wash where he didn't make it is still like the best player at West Ham in a, in a top half side in the Premier League. Like that's that's where I see this kid's floor. But I just I'm worried about his timeline being the same age as some of these other kids as well, and also being the price tag he's going to be with the competition you have. Like he just to me it screams Chelsea for seventy five or whatever, or Chelsea for sixty plus fifteen this summer. Like that's to come over and he's eighteen. Like that mm -hmm. is just it's that kind of deal. So. I, I didn't want to damper the 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 Messino thing because I watched your video and I, I again like he's one of those kids where I, I'm yeah I am I already have pre planned content content that's already made it's already it's already scheduled <laughs> and yet and yet it's like I it's I do it half hearted because it's like you just mm -hmm. you know I think with right. the, the, the search of the Lemania Mall just didn't really line up and with Messino I think like you said it's a player that's so talented you just get him I've seen Real Madrid do this as well they just go out and get Vinicius go yeah. get Enderic go get Rodrigo and I want to see Barcelona do that as well but if they have a logical reason not to go for him which you know again we need a left winger 
makes sense. And you also mentioned about his age. Also, adaptation is very important. Look at Victor Roque. He's come in three, four months ago. He's only gotten a few minutes here. Of course, that red card kind of killed his momentum just a little bit. But again, with Messinho, 18-year-old coming from Brazil, he's going to need at least a year to adapt to the city, the culture, the style of Barcelona as well. Where Nico Williams is friends with half the squad, speaks the language, been playing in the league. So, you know, in terms of adaptation for him, it'll be, a, you know, a piece of cake. So I do like Nico Williams. If we do sign him, I think it'll be a fantastic signing, even though he was free about four months ago. But um, I think it's, you know, having a dynamic winner, the winger in the team will really change the way we play and also give us that different outlook that we have been missing a lot since the departure of Dembele. Yeah, it, it is interesting. And this has not always been the case in Spain. It has ebbed and flowed, but it's interesting that the two players, I think, in Spain that Barcelona would love to bring into their door is Nico Williams, plays for Athletic Club, and Zuba Mendy, plays for Real Sociedad, which are the two teams in Spain that do have we'll say the best retention, the players who are most devoted to the cause and bought the best, in. The best comes. <laughs> exactly. So I, I think that is a particular challenge that, as I've said before, ebbs and flows. Like Johan Cruyff, after the last Cubs were pretty good there in the late 70s and 80s, uh, Cruyff just you know came in, made some phone calls, and plundered <laughs> the, the Bass sides uh, and uh, it, there for the Dream Team. And I could see that not happening right now. I don't think that's... I think the Bass Club's... Have their especially, especially. I want to remind you, if Athletic Club gets that fourth Champions League spot over Atletico Madrid, that's going into it too. There's no way. I say zero percent chance. Nico Williams is going anywhere if Athletic Club is in back in the Champions League. Because that's something with Duamendi last summer. You know, I have exactly. not, these players that play for the Basque clubs. They have this special connection with them. Like they will not leave if they're in a high. They won't even leave there on a low. They have to leave when everything's absolutely perfect. Some of them don't even leave. I mean, look at Adderiz, look at Inaki Williams, who were ceilings were high come, you know, 2014, 2015. They never left. You know, Inigo was a top, top rated center back, was not, of course, at Barcelona, but his whole entire prime of his career from 20 to 33, he was bouncing between the two uh, best clubs. So is it would be difficult. I don't think Athletic Club will get in that Champions League spot. I think the top four right now is pretty cemented, depending on, I think, where teams finish. I wouldn't be surprised if Girona finished fourth, which I've been saying a lot recently. But um, yeah, getting a player like uh, Nico Williams and Zuba Mendy, 100 million for both, I think would elevate the squad beyond belief. But, you know, getting these operations done for the release clause against clubs that, you know, were against us in the Nigeria case, which Laporta takes very, very wholeheartedly, makes these operations, you know, more difficult than they seem. And shout, shouts to Ad- Adarith, by the way, for being having his best season at what thirty three, thirty four. Just keep giving me hope. He just those those are the kind of guys. Like, maybe I'm maybe I'm not over the hill just yet, but uh, I'm not. I'm also not uh, a physical specimen like Adarith was. All right, last three questions, quick questions from the Facebook group, as quick as we can make them. So Benno asked, how much progress can we expect next season if we cannot? And it's funny you mentioned about uh, Vita Roque because. That's part of that off-field stuff that we don't look at. He, when he was asked, like, what players have helped him, it's the ones that speak Portuguese. It's Jao Felix, it's Cancelo, and it's Rafinha. And if you sell Rafinha and you wind up not re-signing the Jaos, like Benno says, and not sign anyone new who speaks Portuguese, then Vida Roque is kind of going to be on his own with a season of a lot of pressure when Lewandowski is likely going to be still there, but winding down even more potentially next season and expected to do a lot. So that is an interesting thing to put all that together. Well, from Victor Roque's perspective, if he wants to have a long career at Barcelona, he's going to have to start learning Spanish. I mean, one of the most shocking things I've seen over the past three years is how quickly Lewandowski learns Spanish. I mean, he's doing interviews and he's talking to the media and like decent Spanish where come a year ago when he was, you know, being presented at the Camp Nou was saying it in English and saying, you know, the typical, uh, Buena tarde, and I'm happy, blah, 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 Vizca Barca, that's it, the simple stuff. And now he's speaking, you know, full Spanish. So from Victor Roque's point of view, I think he is learning Spanish. And if he wants to have a long career at Barcelona, he's going to have to learn that language. And again, Portuguese and Spanish, not too, too different from what I've seen, what I've been told as well. But uh, Victor Roque for me is a top, top talent. I was so, so happy to sign him. I think for the fee, we've done it as well. It was ex- excellent work by Mateo Eleman, Deco, and Jordi Cruyff, of course. At the time, the operation was complete. I had big, big hope for him. I thought he was going to come in and bench Lewandowski, but then Lewandowski kind of had a little bit of wake-up call in the new year. So, again, I think uh, Victor Roque is a top, top talent. And the club think that as well, which is important. Yeah, and, and Benno, to more directly even answer your question, I think that if they don't sign anyone new and they don't resign either Zhao Cancelo or Zhao Felix, I think that makes Alejandro Balde maybe the most important player. 
in the club over the summer. Like, I mean, that's, that's how significant that left back spot then would become. Um, and we would see what happened there. But I think that the club is going to find a way, even on a loan, to make Cancelo work. I think that's going to happen. So I, I would say that if Cancelo only, and no new signings, no Joe Felix returning, just Cancelo is re-signed on another loan, how much progress can we expect next season? I think you want to take another step forward. And I think that is possible. So I, that's the easy answer I'll give you there. Um, speaking of Lewandowski, by the way, uh, we have a question from Ram. But before that, I want to add to that, that Ter Stegen, Lewandowski, Rakitic. I'm just shouting out some of the guys that I know have been like amazing with languages. Some guys, it just comes naturally. Like some mm-hmm. people are just really good with languages and some aren't. And like, I mean, for example, like Dembele is fluent in Spanish, but obviously never showed it. <laughs> he, he speaks very quietly in the same way. Like we all know that Messi can speak English, but he never would. Um, and so I'm I pray for that day, though. I'm pray for that day. See Messi speak English. I think we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think the internet won't. <laughs> but uh, I, I mean, I've asked him to come on the show in English. He just refuses. But um, <laughs> yeah, I know. I think some guys like they're a little slower to languages and not comfortable with it. And then some guys just are willing to go for it and make mistakes. And uh, and that's awesome. Like I saw a baseball player. The MLB season just started. And I saw a baseball player. Uh, he did his first interview. He was a Spanish speaker, I believe, from either Costa Rica or the Dominican Republic. And he did his first interview without his translator. And it was just like a really, it's just a cool moment. It's just like, he's like, yeah, I worked really hard on this. Talking to my teammates, like, it's been a really difficult year. But yeah, I got you. You know what I mean? I got you. And, mm-hmm. um, and, he, and you're, again, this is us in East, EST time, right? Uh, East, East Coast time or in the US, which is here, it's a little different because we aren't taught and languages do not flow <laughs> the way they do so freely to Europe. But to Ram's question. Leaving out all other positions, will we be able to challenge for all possible titles with Lewandowski as the lead striker next season? Has he got the legs for another season? And is Vitor Roque, can he handle being the understudy? Or do you think Vitor Roque will be able to take Lewandowski's spot? Um, in terms of uh, Vitor Roque taking Lewandowski's spot next season, there will definitely, become an, there will definitely have an opportunity for that, like we saw this season. From, you know, middle of November to beginning of January, Lewandowski is one of the Worst players, worst strikers I've seen in a very, very long time at Barcelona. And that would have been a great opportunity for Victor Roque to come in and take his spot. And Xavi kept on playing Lewandowski because, firstly, some managers think that when a striker is going through a rough patch, you just have to keep playing them, keep playing them, and pray that something happens. I don't know if you remember Suarez in the beginning of the 17-18 season, where if you look at his numbers, sensational seasons, the first 12 games, he was absolutely dreadful. He was missing 1v1s, he was missing open nets. But again, Valverde kept on saying that he's just he just needs that push. Once he gets that first goal... It's going to flow. And for Lewandowski, that happened for him as well. Can we challenge for next season, uh, ch- titles next season with Lewandowski up front? Yes. That's why the club are going to back him. That's why they're going to keep him. I think he's done enough this season to show that we can survive with him for one more season. And again, Victor Roque is going to come fresh, six months off adapting the Barcelona City culture and style, pushing for that spot. I'm very excited to see how Victor Roque does in preseason as well. Um, I think it's going to come down to who the new coach is and who, if Chavi stays. And also, on the moments, if we, you know, how we finish this season, what will the expectations be for next season as well? All this plays a part. So I think it's a great question to ask, but slightly early to ask it. I think it's uh, in terms of, of course, Lewandowski and Victor Roque definitely being the two strikers for Barcelona next season, but implications and standards, they're not quite fine tuned yet to really put, you know, expectation and put an actual mark on it, I think. But other than Holland around world football, who at the number nine position? Because again, like when the guys, when they don't score every game, they get criticism because that's their mm-hmm. job or goals. And so I feel like, yeah, I expect Lewandowski to take another step back next season. And for Vitor Roque, I don't expect him to be the man, but I do expect him to be a part of the squad. And I do look around Europe and say, how many squads actually do have the luxury of having, we'll say, not to say a 1A, because that's not what Lewandowski I think will be next season, but to have two guys that you could call a 1B striker, right? Like two guys you're like, do I trust him today? Probably, right? The two guys you can trust or hope you can trust half the time. That is what you'd, you'd want and expect. Uh, okay, now last question here. You, you, if Barca get knocked out uh, by PSG while being competitive, should Laporta, Deco, and company still try to go all out to keep Xavi for another season? Uh, yes, I think, <laughs> again, it comes down mainly for me personally, on the replacements. I think that Xavi is still a strong coach, a good coach. If Xavi wants to leave, of course, if he says, look, I'm burnt out, and, and you know, I think it's better for the club for to, to find another manager, fair enough. But if I'm Laporta and Uste and Deco, I would be saying, Xavi, we want you to stay. We think you're the right person moving forward. This point project, you know, is 
we're at the halfway mark now. This is going to be the final push where we see, you know, results consistently and titles consistently. Um, I think from the fan point of view, it will definitely change for sure. It depends, of course. I think one of the big uh, implications, apart from the PSG game, is the Classico. How we perform in the Classico at the Bernabeu, where Xavi has a pretty good record as well. We go there, tie, but compete. You're thinking, uh... We've lost basically all the classicals this season. You go there, you win 3-0 in a emphatic performance, and you still get knocked out by PSG. All these things will have implications. But I think no matter what, even if we finish, you know, second La Liga, knocked out by PSG, and let's say hypothetically draw the Classico, the board will want to keep Chavi no matter what. Because again, the main thing is the replacements currently are not really moving me, not really moving the board either. Yeah, it is. It's it's this thing that I think you and I in the content world kind of forget about sometimes. Not even forget, but we kind of have to ignore the fact that results do create implications for everything, right? And as much as we do our homework and say, well, we think this is going to happen, we think this is going to happen, results dictate what happens next in the world of football. And it is so difficult. It becomes a prediction game. And I said, I could go through the money and the money kind of, you know, let the money guide you to what the future is in the long term. But as you mentioned, from week to week and even season to season, the results from game to game and those big games like El Clasico and Champions League, they matter more than anything else. Uh, so yeah, I agree with all that. Nothing to add there, except I want to finally, I'll ask you my question is Barca boy. What do you got going on? Uh, many of things, of course, on the YouTube channel, I'll try my best to provide content as heavily as I can, you know, transfer videos every day, opinion videos, live watch alongs, match reviews, match previews, this, that's basically all I do, of course, but my opinion on Twitter as well when I feel, you know, stuck in my thoughts. And, uh, yeah, I work, uh, do a lot of written, uh, writing articles for Barca Buzz and, you know, Blog Garnogram as well. So doing many of things in the world of Barcelona because that's where the passion is and that's where the love will always has and always will be. Yeah, so he's Barca boy on pretty much everything. His social is down in the description or show notes below, as well as a link to his YouTube channel. So yeah, I mean, there, there are YouTube channels that will say are underappreciated. And uh, I look at your subscriber count, I look at mine, I'm like, yeah, we gotta, we got, we almost gotta, we gotta do that thing where we go to the camp, no, with a trench coat, you know, on each other's shoulders. I know like we're both adults, but I'm saying we gotta <laughs> do like the trench coat in a YouTube, well, or like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know yeah, what I'm saying? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're understanding what I'm painting you. Yes, uh, the the movie theater with the kids in the t in the trench coat. But we got to do that to like the YouTube Barca community algorithm or something, or find a way to be like, hey, we've got we've got two twenty thousand or whatever fifteen thousand YouTube subscriber channels stacked on top of each other and uh, <laughs> and do that. So anyway, so follow everybody, both Barca Boy and the Barcelona Podcast wherever you do any of your content. We're pretty much everywhere. And then of course these questions. Patreon, guaranteed to answer them as low as $3, as well as getting the podcast without the ads. And then, of course, a good rating on the podcast app, subscribe to the YouTube channel, the best way to help the show, as well as a close Facebook group. Discord, I do apologize to my Discord crew. I forgot to put the listener questions there. But if you have any additional ones, again, throw them in there when I get a chance to, a free moment. I'll answer them on the show. Don't worry. Most importantly, though, thanks so much for listening to the show. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon. Forza Barca. Barca.